I'm very happy to, to be here today and give this talk. And it's a welcome opportunity for me to return to an article I wrote last spring. Uh, it was published in the journal Journals and Studies um, in September, and I think the print issue is coming out um, in April. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, not so quickly. Um, so just to give you a bit of background, um, um, over the last few years I've been working, as um, you've just heard, on, on migration and new media, and my work is largely ethnographic. I've been, um, I had an ESRC grant investigating how transnational families uh, deal with separation and use new media to keep in touch um, and, and care for each other. So new media like Skype, Facebook, uh, mobile phones and so on. And most of the talks I <laughs> give these days are actually on this topic. But this research was also an opportunity for me to reflect a bit more broadly on the nature of social media and, and how they might reconfigure processes like um, public participation or humanitarian communication, which is our topic today, and new storytelling. Uh, so these have been also long in, long-standing interests of mine. So this is sort of how this paper emerged. So it, it's this result of this process of reflection on social media and humanitarian communication. And this connection between social media and humanitarian communication and is rather recent, but it seems today that almost all uh, humanitarian campaigns will have a social media component. Uh, and I think um, this definitely is, I think the turning point was the Haiti earthquake in 2010. Uh, when crowdsourcing software like Ushahidi was used to help you know, locate people um, or uh, identify medical needs or casualties. Um, and, and I think it was a turning point in the sense that humanitarian organizations realized the potential of social media for reaching out to donors, but also raising awareness for their causes. Um, and it's not difficult to see why. Uh, social media are too big to ignore. Uh, Facebook alone uh, has over a billion uh, active uh, monthly users, half of whom are um, uh, daily active users. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's a huge um, uh, network of people out there uh, that, um, you know, um, obviously humanitarian organizations want to exploit. Um, I think one reason why um, humanitarian organizations are particularly attracted to social media is because of this combination of uh, the ability to reach these vast audiences, these network, networked publics, and also uh, um, achieving this with a high degree of disintermediation. Um, in the past, uh, organizations would have to go through the traditional gatekeepers, very often media organizations, but now they can bypass those and therefore um, uh, reach these um, uh, huge network publics. Um, there is also an assumption, and I guess I think this is something that needs to be investigated empirically, but there is an assumption that um, social media campaigns add authenticity, veracity, legitimacy to, to, the, to the campaigns um, because they allow the sufferers to speak for themselves or they involve citizen journalists and so on. Um, and there is also something else that I think makes social media particularly attractive, which is that they uh, there is a claim uh, for action. Social media favor action. Uh, they encourage users to do something with the information they receive, even if that is just to click um, on their, uh, uh, you know, paying uh, button. So, um, for all these reasons, social media have become very relevant. Um, and I think that there has been a lot of enthusiasm um, on. The, the potential for social media for humanitarian communication, especially for fostering a cosmopolitan public. And perhaps no other c humanitarian campaign encapsulated this enthusiasm um, uh, more than the Comey 2012 viral campaign. Now, I'm not sure if you remember this, uh, but this was a, a, a video and a, a campaign that took the world by storm in, in 2012. And I'm asking you whether you're familiar with Connie, uh, because this year I actually asked my students, and about half of them had not heard of it. So <laughs> it just shows you how quickly it kind of faded from our memories, and it shows perhaps uh, how quick, you know, it shows also some of the problems of, of, of uh, associated with this campaign that we will try to sort of illustrate uh, today. Uh, but um, this uh, video campaign was launched on March 5th. Uh, and it was launched by a Christian organization called Invisible Children, 
based in San Diego, California. Um, and it's named after a Ugandan warlord, Joseph Kony, who um, was heading the LRA army, which operated in northern Uganda and in recent years uh, in the wider region. Um, I, I don't want to say too much about the aims of the campaign, because this was part of the problem of this video, that they did not really articulate what the aims of this um, campaign were. So I'll, I'll leave that for later. But um, um, it was, as I said, a 30-minute uh, video. Uh, and attached to that was a wider campaign, including merchandise, T-shirts, posters, a website, and so on. Uh, the week following posting, um, it attracted the video attracted more than a million views, which is almost uh, it is a record actually, especially for a video of its kind. Um, so it went viral. Um, according to data released by Pew Internet, um, the, in the week following its posting, there were more than a five million tweets on Connie 2012, most of those tweets were actually positive, supportive of, of the campaign. So 66% of those comments were positive. Again, that's according to the data released by Pew. 17% uh, skeptical or negative, with 16% neutral. Uh, but I think it's a staggering amount to think that uh, the average um, tweets per day, the average number of tweets per day, it, uh, was almost a million four hundred thousand, which is, you know, mind-boggling. Um, now, most of the people who um, uh, who were sort of exposed to this message were young adults. Uh, I think that's interesting that the, the ages of 18 to 29 were particularly uh, aware of this campaign, and this is usually the group that is associated with civic disengagement and ap apathy and so on. Um, so 58% of US young adults said they had heard about the film and most of them had heard about it through the internet. So you can see, and I don't have a very sophisticated graph, I'm afraid, this is just a screen grab, but you can see that the moment um, the, the, the campaign was accessed through mobile media, it actually went uh, up very uh, quickly, uh, still on the day of its release, but it was like a critical moment. The moment that it was embedded on Facebook was a turning point, and then the moment it started being accessed through mobile media, really, um, uh, meant that it started spreading like wildfire. Um, I think interesting uh, as well is that uh, Invisible Children, the organization it, in responsible for the video, reported that they received 3.6 million support pledges in the days following the video's release. So that was quite, um, you know, it was successful uh, for them, or at least initially. Uh, so was the Connie 2012 campaign uh, proof of the power of social media to foster a, cos a cosmopolitan public sphere? Was this an example of the world coming together against a, um, uh, or a, against a, 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 you know, a, a crime um, uh, that was um, reported in, in, this, in this fashion? Did social media transform the mediation of suffering? Uh, and crucially, did they represent an opportunity to bridge this fathomless distance between the sufferer and the spectator, to paraphrase, paraphrase the late Stan Cohen? Um, so I think to really answer this question, we need to look at two areas of scholarship. Um, and the first is uh, humanitarian communication, uh, and the other is um, um, our study and understanding of social media. Um, now, if we look at humanitarian communication, um, this has been a burgeoning field uh, in recent years, uh, with contributions by scholars such as Luke Boltanski, who wrote, who wrote Distant Suffering uh, in the late 1990s, Lili Kuliaraki, who has really defined the field, and also the late uh, Roger Silverstone. Um, and Kuliaraki's key argument uh, is that um, it is really media content that defines uh, that determines the type of engagement of action and the, and the way that spectators engage with distant suffering. So it is really the, the, the conditions of mediation the, and the content of, of the campaign that really, really determines the suffering. And my argument here is that if we really want to understand the role of social media, we cannot just look at the, the content of the campaign. We also have to understand the nature of the social media. We have to understand their architectures. We have to understand um, uh, what they do and how they do it. We have to understand their affordances. So this is kind of one of the contributions I bring to this conversation. Um, 
this understanding of the architectures of social media and how they might contribute to the way spectators, users, you know, people like us engage with distant others. Um, and the other thing I want to do in this paper is to, to reflect a little bit on the phenomenon of CONI 2012 a bit more broadly. Because the more I started looking at this um, uh, phenomenon, I realized that it wasn't just the video itself. A week after its release, um, or <coughs> even before that, there was a slew of content that was produced online and offline that was criticizing the film. There were blogs, uh, tweets, um, uh, uh, programs, and, uh, documentaries, uh, sometimes documentaries that were involving the people of Uganda who had actually been voiceless in the original film itself. And so there was a, a counter narrative that became so dominant that I think there was a conversation that was emerging uh, both online and offline about the ethics of distant suffering. And this was, it was one of the first times that actually this conversation was taking place in the public domain. So I started thinking that Connie was not just the documentary itself, but we can think of it as a phenomenon, a phenomenon that extends beyond a specific medium, uh, a, you know, a documentary that is embedded in social media. And actually it becomes, uh, something wider than that, what I call a polymedia event. And I developed that term polymedia through um, drawing on, on, on a theory in a book I recently wrote with uh, Danny Miller, uh, which draws on our work on uh, interpersonal communication and in, the in, the, in the digitally mediated environment. So this is going to be the second part of my paper, to try and think whether the CONI campaign was actually something that extended beyond social media and, and became a, a, an event, a phenomenon uh, that was wider than that. So those are the two key points I want to make. And um, what I want to do now in the remaining uh, time is to um, very h briefly highlight some of the issues and debates that are taking place in humanitarian communication and social media research, the two fields I'm trying to bring together and then uh, analyze the campaign focusing on these themes, this intermediation and the democratization of visibility, the question of action and you know, what is action and what is engagement, um, and then this question of cosmopolitanism and whether this was achieved in this, in this particular campaign. So <coughs> humanitarian communication, um, although it's generally accepted that uh, the media, both old and new, have increased the representation of suffering. Um, or, yeah, they have increased, there is a quantitative increase uh, in terms of the visibility of distant suffering. There isn't that much agreement as to whether this is a positive or a negative thing, um, predictably, perhaps. Um, there are, broadly speaking, two major ethical norms. Cosmopolitanism, on the one hand, and communitarianism, on the, on the other. Um, so. Cosmopolitanism represents, if you want, the optimistic scenario for global connectivity. Um, it refers to this idea that the media, by making visible the suffering of others, um, initiate a process of reflexivity. Um, and therefore, they contribute to this democratization of, of engagement um, and, and the democratization of responsibility. Um, uh, now, communitarianism is, is, is different in the sense that this reflexivity uh, and this notion of responsibility is absent. Communitari communitarianism, as we probably know, is, is very much about the celebration of our, our th the things that bring us together, this feeling in common that, that people might share, the spectators might share. So it's not about transcending the self or the community, it's about reaffirming the community. It's not about having an orientation to the distance other, it's about um, celebrating what brings the, the spectators um, together. So in that sense, there is a more pessimistic scenario here associated with communitarianism. There isn't this sort of transcendence um, that we find in cosmopolitanism. Uh, Nahu Yaraki, and I've mentioned her work already, um, has said that we need, we need to move beyond this, um, these two poles and really try to think of, uh, of what actually can cultivate cosmopolitan sensibilities or what, what is it that actually determines uh, the spectator's uh, position vis-a-vis -vis suffering. And she says it's really the conditions of mediation. And by that she means, 
just to um, um, uh, simplify it, that the way television tells the stories of suffering will determine the way sufferers will engage. It will determine the ethical relationship to the sufferer. Um, I think that there is a, a metaphor of distance that we can apply here, and I think it might illustrate some of these, some of these uh, debates. Um, when the sufferer is, is represented as too distant, something that we cannot even relate to, something that is so far away that we have no connection to, this is what Huliaraiti calls adventure news, then this is, 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 it will not really um, make the, 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 the viewer or the spectator, as she calls them, uh, be engaged. When the suffering is too close, uh, it's again problematic because there is the celebration of the self. There is too much identification, and that is also um, a, a problem. So you need really this proper distance to use Silverstone, Silverstone's work, neither too close nor too uh, far away, to really um, develop this reflexivity that is important in order to, uh, to, to engage with the suffering of others. And you need that space because it is in that space that you can actually begin to understand the conditions of the suffering. And without this understanding, there is action doesn't really uh, matter or doesn't really have that moral weight, which is important for cosmopolitanism. Um, now, I've mentioned action, and I think this is important too, because it's, 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 um, it's a theme, it's an important theme also when we think about social media, which are very action-oriented. And, and I want to think action here within um, a tripartite model of engagement, which doesn't only favor action, but sees action as part of understanding and talking. And there have been models in you know, uh, continental philosophy that have favored one of these approaches or the other. So that some um, you know, uh, deliberative democracy might be favoring talk, for instance, as a much more important form of engagement. Other models may have favored action. I think that we really have to, and it's not just me for, you know, drawing on our rent and others, we really need to think of action as part of um, uh, this whole uh, model, uh, tripartite model. Um, but this is not really how action is conceptualized in contemporary humanitarian campaigns, which seem to fetishize action, but they also seem to decouple it from understanding or from um, uh, emotions. Um, and, and this is, I think, uh, an important point, again, highlighted by Huliaraki and her development of the post-humanitarian notion. And what she means by post-humanitarian is that these recent campaigns, um, uh, humanitarian campaigns, have been emphasizing, um, the emphasis really is on the Western spectators, not so much on the sufferers, but on, on, on the spectators. So there is this self-referential self element and, and an introspective dimension. The cause is being de-emotionalized, very often stylized, so there is an emphasis on aesthetics, but not necessarily on the conditions of suffering. So there isn't really an attempt to try and explain, you know, or to contextualize historically why the events um, uh, are taking place, why suffering occurs. And, and action is being fetishized in the sense that there is this technologization of action, uh, which other authors might call clicktivism. So rather than thinking, why is this event occurring? How can I help? How can I become engaged? The emphasis is on click a button and pay, you know, donate. So this is a different way of, of contributing. So hopefully um, all these um, ideas will become clear once we start looking at the campaign, the Connie campaign more, more closely. Um, but I think that's enough for now. Um, moving on to social media, um, I realize I'm at the Internet Institute, so I probably don't need to say too much about um, uh, uh, social media. But still, I think I should I should um, highlight here that I'm I'm comparing two networking sites uh, specifically because these two were instrumental in the campaign, and those are Facebook and Twitter. They also happen to be two of the most popular uh, social networking sites, anyway. Um, and these two sites have different or four different degrees of publicness. Uh, with Twitter being a bit more open than Facebook. But I think what's most important here is that in both these 
uh, sites. Communication is structured around networks of people who know each other already. Um, people who are drawn together because of their existing connections and similarities. So communication can be understood as a performance to already existing social contacts, brought together and made visible through social networking software, which publicly articulate networks of friendship and connections. Um, I mean, we know from research, and I'm, ref you know, just to give you an example, Marwick and, and Boyd have um, have um, argued very convincingly that audiences, uh, people on Twitter, act as if their audience is bounded. So they people post on Twitter with a very specific audience in mind, with thinking people they know uh, that will read their tweets. Th these tweets might be read by other people, but I think what's important is that there is this implied audience, which is, or imagined audience, that is very specific. Uh, and this specific audience usually consists of friends, um, or relatives, or acquaintances. Um, so, the other thing we know, of course, from the literature is that there is a very strong uh, process of presenting the self. The presentation of the self is very important in social networking sites and, and users constantly update their profiles and, uh, and try to uh, control it as much as they can. It's impossible, of course, to control it completely, but this is a very important part of what uh, social networking sites are about. Um, so, um, um, so I think this is another important dimension to bear in mind when thinking that this communication, this humanitarian communication, is taking place in an environment where the presentation of the self is, um, is quite important. And significantly, as again I'm sure you know, the affordances of these social media um, create, you know, certain, um, well, create certain opportunities but also constraints in terms of how these interactions um, take place. So I think it's important to remember that uh, users' interactions and the self-presentation um, on social network networking sites are traceable because the content is persists, it's there. You know, once it's online, it cannot be erased effectively. Unlike fleeting face-to-face -face interactions, um, these uh, conversations, these interactions are retrievable, they are visible, they are searchable, uh, so there, I there are all these dimensions which are important and again determine the kind of interactions afforded in these environments. Um, so I think these are the points I want to highlight, which I think again will become clear as we look, in, um, look at this campaign a bit more um, systematically. So let me move to my first theme, which is this intermediation and the democratization of visibility. Now, a much celebra celebrated dimension of internet-based communication is this intermediation, the fact that traditional gatekeepers can now be bypassed and we can um, no longer have to depend on these organizations in order to get the information out. You can reach your audiences um, directly. And I think Connie is very interesting because it presented itself as such, but actually, as um, if, but if you look at the, its website, even what uh, it's, it's been changed now, is that you can see very quickly that celebrities played a huge role in, in, in making this um, campaign a success. Um, there were um, a number of celebrities targeted by Invisible Children, this organization, most notably Oprah Winfrey, but also Mark Zuckerberg, George, George Clooney, Lady Gaga, Angelina Jolie, just to go through the first line. Mm -hmm. um, and, but there were also politicians like George W. Bush and Bill Clinton and Mitt Romney and so on. So these people uh, may or may not have had prior knowledge of this campaign. I think some did. Um, became very apparent, but they certainly supported this campaign and users were encouraged to tweet. So all these are links to these individuals' Twitter accounts so that users could then tweet Condoleezza Rice or Jay-Z and say, can you please retweet Stop Connie? Can you support this campaign? And in fact, when Oprah tweeted to her 10 million followers, there was a 13 
1,536% increase in the video views of this campaign, which just shows you that the role of celebrities was catalytic in how quickly this video spread. So if this video spread like wildfire, it was not because there were no intermediaries. There were just different intermediaries, not the traditional gatekeepers, but these were people who um, uh, played an important role um, in making this com campaign successful. So I think it's a bit of a myth to say that you know this was a disintermediated campaign. I think it was disin disintermediated in some ways, but clearly there was a very important role that celebrities played. Um, but does this mean, I mean, even if there was this degree of disintermediation, does it mean that the Connie campaign was, um, um, was actually democratizing uh, this responsibility? Was it, was it democratizing the, spa the space of appearance, to use Hannah Arendt's word? Uh, or phrase, um, was, it, was it actually a qualitative improvement in the representation of distant suffering? Um, because that's the other question we need to, we need to, to really address. Um, and I think one observation is that if we look at the video, 2000, the, the original video, because there were two videos uh, that were released by Invisible Children. The first was on, released on May 5th, and this is the one we're really discussing today. But a month following that, especially um, given the criticisms the first video received, Invisible Children released a follow-up video that was trying to do a bit of historical contextualization that had been absent in the first film. And uh, so in, in Connie 2012, suffering was conspicuously absent. Um, and I can show you um, a clip later on, um, which I think um, is indicative if we have time. <coughs> so for a 30 minute documentary, and you know, 30 minutes is, a, is, is quite a long time, um, there was virtually no historical contextualization. I think importantly, the victims are not given any voice. So uh, apart from one young boy who is the friend of the narrator, and he's, we hear his voice, no other Ugandan speaks in that film. And, and what you often have is close-ups of or uh, long shots of other Ugandan people in very quick uh, sequence. But there isn't really any um, uh, attempt to give voice to the sufferers themselves. So the Ugandan people appear relatively disempowered in this, in this, in this context, um, in need of a Western intervention. Um, which is a problematic representation uh, that pr produces um, discredited discourses about dependency. Um, by contrast, the, p the, the film emphasizes in all possible ways the agency of Western publics. So there is, um, the film begins with a line, right now there are more people on Facebook uh, than there were on the planet 200 years ago. And this sets the tone for the whole film that you know, um, the people of Facebook are the Western publics. Um, these are the people who can change the world. Um, there is an emphasis on um, um, you know, um, people going to concerts, wearing the Connie bracelets, which were uh, sort of a symbol for the campaign. Um, they, there is a high sort of energy electronica music that accompanies the whole film. Uh, so I think that's, that's, that's an important um, theme. Uh, I think also what's important is that the film is narrated through, um, it, 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 it's a, there is a, a key f um, narrator, Jason Russell, who is also a key member of Invisible Children, this organization, and he narrates this film to his four-year-old child. So the whole film is, is basically a simplified narrative of ethnic conflict, as told to a four-year-old who really um, you know, understands this uh, conflict using the Sky Wars uh, language. And I can, I can show you a clip if we have time, just to, um, oops, maybe I have to, do I have to cut and paste it? Yeah, you might have Probably, to. yeah. I mean, we can do it at the end if we have mm -hmm. time. Um, uh, it's just the film where he tries to, I don't know, have you, have you all seen this film? Mm. Yeah, okay. So you know what I'm talking about. He tries to explain the actions of uh, Joseph Kony to uh, a four-year-old, and, and it is um, a very simplified, uh, problematic way of, of explaining a very complex uh, phenomenon. 
and, 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 and you know, series of events. Um, just to focus on this poster, too, um, I mean, this is Joseph Conley, um, and, but behind is Osama bin Laden and Adolf, Adolf Hitler. So, and this is clearly a, an example of pastiche, how, you know, um, uh, you know pop art is, is, is used, and this is the type of posters that were also used in the Obama campaign in, uh, in 2008. Um, but also this association with figures that have been, uh, you know, uh, considered to be uh, evil in, in, in the history of, of mankind. So again, irony, playfulness, <laughs> pastiche, these are key themes in, in the dis discussion of the post-humanitarian by, by Hilaire Aiki. Um, so if we apply the metaphor <coughs> of distance here, um, I think this is very revealing because what, what, what we see is that um, um, there is this very strong sense of identification. I mean, this is, again, the celebration of the Western <coughs> public, the celebration of the people who have the power to change things. Uh, this is not a, an example of suffering. This is about how the Westerners have to identify with this campaign because this is who they are. So this is the narcissism and the self-referential self self um, dimension that, again, uh, we were um, talking about earlier in the discussion of the post-humanitarian. So this celebration of citizen engagement is ecstatic, again to use Hulyaraki's word, um, word and, and narcissistic. You know, you have to donate because you are one of these empowered people. You have to be part of this because this is uh, our chance to shape, you know, humanity. Um, but even though there is this very strong self-identification, the cause itself, the, the real reason why this campaign is, 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 is taking place is completely demotionalized because the sufferers have not been given any voice. We haven't heard their voice. So there is no sense of reflexivity or proper distance in order to understand um, um, uh, the, 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 the reasons why, why uh, we should be concerned about uh, these events in the first place. So there is no bridging of this profound distance between the sufferer and the spectator, again, to return to Stan Cohen's. Let me reflect a bit on this notion of action. Um, and the things we can <coughs> say here is that, I mean, the, <coughs> the first um, users were very much in, encouraged to forward the video. That's the first action that uh, people were asked to do, uh, forward um, the link to the video, embed the video in your, in your, in your um, uh, profile, um, but then also buy the bracelet. This is the bracelet, which functions as a sartorial prop. There, was also, there were also t-shirts that one could buy. There was, in fact, a whole kit uh, people could buy to show the, sh the support of Connie. And these kits were sold out very, very quickly. So. Um, so this action, um, to a large extent, is an example of marketization because um, this, this action is subjected to the market logic. Users are urged to click and to pay in order to buy the kit. Um, the, the apparently revolutionary zeal of posting po posters in Coney 2012 passed through one's wallet. Y the poster was not for free. You had to pay for it to download it or to get the kit. Um, so even though, I mean, we can apply a, a sort of a consequentialist or, or utilitarian perspective on ethics, that as long as people help, as long as the organization is helped, um, then it doesn't matter why they do it. But I think even then, we are left wondering, what are they helping for? Because the causes of this campaign have not been explained properly. Was this a campaign for military action? Because the the, the the motto of the campaign is stop Connie. How would one stop Connie? Because there was a, a moment in the documentary where they were asking for more, uh, clear uh, military intervention from the United States. So is this a campaign about uh, um, helping the victims? Is it a campaign to encourage military action? The, the goals remained opaque and dubious. And I, I'm not sure that people who bought the kit were um, clear about this. But of course, we need some audience research to, to be sure about that. Um, but I think this is a clear example of what we um, meant earlier when uh, we, we, we discussed this technologization of action. 
the emphasis really here is on clicking, not really on why one is clicking or why one is buying or uh, engaging uh, with. The, the emphasis is really on, 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 on make sure you get this kit and then everything else will kind of fall into place. Um, the other issue I think that we need to bear in mind is who, you know, who are the um, viewers or users um, uh, relating to? If they're reposting or forwarding, they're forwarding to their friends. So again, it's this network of people who already know each other, the network of people who are uh, familiar with each other. So again, this communitarian spirit being um, uh, celebrated and, and um, emphasized. So all this is really, to su all, all this suggests that the spirit of cosmopolitanism, the cosmopolitan sensibilities that were um, uh, brought about with uh, the possibilities opened up by new media are very elusive. Uh, and I have a quote here from Ulrich Beck, that cosmopolitan sensibility opens up a space for dialogic imagination and everyday practice, involving the capacity to see oneself from the perspective of cultural others. So this uh, self-reflexivity and the boundary transcending imagination that should be part of cosmopolitanism were very absent from this particular documentary. And, and so cosmopolitanism was not really fulfilled. But is this really the only thing we can say about this campaign? Because as I said earlier, yes, when we look at the film itself, and when we look at the campaign, and when we look at the way it spread through social media, it was really problematic. <coughs> but this campaign also triggered a range of other re responses and a range of other media, <coughs> in fact, mediated responses, mainly, um, which in some way transcended uh, this campaign uh, itself. So as I had started writing this paper, uh, in my attempt to sort of uh, bring in the importance of network architectures into this discussion of co humanitarian communication, I realized that uh, there was something much wider going on. And this was really uh, a phenomenon. Connie 2012 was becoming a phenomenon that kind of uh, exceeded, um, extended beyond the actual film, the actual documentary. Uh, we had you know, a number of examples, um, but just to show you some screen grabs, um, mm -hmm. Frontline SMS, who you may be familiar with, um, pair, you know, uh, joined forces with Al Jazeera to bring accounts of Ugandan people uh, to the public domain. So there were um, these webcasts with Ugandan people, you know, talking about their perspective on, on, on this uh, issue. Then, um, uh, Global Voices, again, another platform of bloggers, had a sort of links to various blogs that were written. Um, uh, again, African Voices respond to hyper popular Kony 2012 viral campaign. These are just a few things I had collected at the time. And the Stop <laughs> the War Coalition, as well, also creating its own pastiche mm -hmm. with the Tony 2012 campaign, uh, saying invisible Iraqi children the face of Tony Blair there. So uh, there was a lot going on. And, and there was also, in the traditional media, a lot of debate and, and conversation about the ethics of humanitarian communication in a way that I don't think had been done before. It was a very sort of in intense period. Um, it may have died down very quickly, but still, I think it was important that it happened. So I thought, you know, could this be something different than just a social media campaign? Could Connie 2012 be understood as a polymedia event? And I'm really drawing here on the traditional uh, media events theory. Those of you who come from media studies may be familiar with this, but this is a theory developed by Daniel Dayan and Elihu Kanz on how media events, um, which are usually public, formal, planned events, the, the high holidays of, of mass communication, which foster a national identity. Um, uh, and uh, examples of, uh, of media events would be royal weddings or the Olympics, uh, events for which the audience had to figuratively, figuratively at least dress up for, um, televised traditionally, so very much part of this broadcast culture. Uh, so 
I wanted to see whether polymedia events w could be a new way to rework this concept of media events. Not necessarily to replace it, because we might still have media events of sorts. We still had recently had royal weddings and Olympics and, and so on. So again, media events would have to be reconfigured for that, um, for a new media age. But I'm trying with polymedia events to capture something different, um, which is um, how can media, wh uh, sorry, events which are triggered by the media um, and, and can then um, pl be played out in the media, uh, take place you know, in a range of media technologies across the, you know, the mediated environment um, with no official or central narrative. Um, so that, that was really the, 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 the idea that um, uh, I started working with. And I'm drawing here on the idea of polymedia, which refers to the integrated environment of converging communicative opportunities, comprising of technologies, media platforms, and applications as they intersect and hybridize. And this is a, a theory which um, uh, I developed with, with Danny Miller in the context of personal communication. What we were interested in was to move beyond um, the study of media as um, uh, discrete technologies with associated affordances but, and try and understand how people navigate an environment of mediated opportunities, exploiting contrast between media in order to manage their relationships. So how people uh, might use email because they want to introduce some distance in the communication, but they might use a phone because they want to have a more immediate interaction. And, 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 and how they might, how they, the choice of medium might acquire communicative intent. Um, but that's not really what I'm, how I'm using the, the polymedia term here. I'm really using polymedia in this more simple way, the integrated environment <coughs> of communicative opportunities. Because it's now almost impossible to think of media in, in isolation. You can't really have just, let's say, television the recent scandal with the BBC last year and the McAlpine affair, I think, is indicative of that. But you know, you know, news travels from one medium to the other, so you would have a story as it's told on Newsnight, and then you might have Twitter uh, comments, and then blogs, and then uh, newspaper articles. So news will travel across a, a number of different um, sites, and and this is pretty much what happens with a polymedia event. You have um, stories and events which unfold across different media platforms which are part of this composite environment of polymedia. And I think that Coney 2012 was a pretty typical polymedia event. It started as a YouTube documentary, but its controversial character generated a plethora of blogs, and I showed you some of those um, just before. Um, um, so if we want to be a bit more systematic, here are some initial thoughts as to what might constitute um, uh, polymedia events. So th these are events which start in developing the media. Um, and I think another example um, would be the Yilans Post and uh, the Danish newspapers um, cartoons of uh, uh, Mohammed, Prophet Mohammed. Um, so the, Moha the Mohammed cartoons uh, uh, controversy uh, by Yilans Posten in 2005 and also last year there were the film protests in last uh, September 2011 um, triggered by similar events. So that, that would be what I mean by events which start and develop in the media. So it's an event that starts in the media and then starts to spread um, in different media platforms. You have to have at least a half a dozen platforms involved because I think if it's only two it's not really um, the kind of uh, environment uh, uh, argument that I'm trying to make here. Uh, although you could have an environment with just two uh, platforms, but I, I'm thinking of media that travel across a number of platforms, and therefore the architecture of each particular medium is transcended. So it's not the social media that determine the kind of communication, because the architecture of one medium will complement or supplement the architecture of the other medium. So there is no specific mediality here. I think there is um, a much wider environment um, uh, uh, that, that, is, it, that, that matters, and not the specific mediality or architecture of specific uh, technologies. 
there is no there isn't a single narrative and I think that's important as well there, there are con con uh, contrasting contradictory uh, narratives um, parallel running in parallel multiple strands so there isn't really one uh, key um, narrative uh, that, that, that or d one dominant narrative uh, they, these events are viral so they're large in scale and audience reach and they're also transnational in line with you know, sort of new media more broadly. So I don't think this is a, a very um, common phenomenon. I would say polymedia events are rare. And I think few events fill the above criteria, especially the multiplicity and decentralized criterion. Um, and I think as, as many authors uh, have argued, um, far from delivering on the promised potential, digital technologies are not inherently changing journalism or storytelling for the better. Uh, very often news in the digital, digital environment is much more about more of the same rather than pl pl plurality and diversity. But when they do occur, because of their decentralized nature, polymedia events can trigger, um, uh, can potentially play a, a role in, in uh, moral education. Um, because of their fragmented and decentralized nature, they invite people, and I'm not saying that they actually fulfill this role, but at least it's an invitation. So they invite people to connect the dots and put the pieces of the jigsaw together. So if one was to follow all these different blogs and the Connie campaign itself, one could then begin to start to wonder what was actually happening in Uganda. Is then uh, a concern with this big moral question of why which can be a precondition for token action. So although the campaign itself did not really open that big moral question, because it triggered, because of it was so controversial, because it triggered this wider public debate, it may have unwittingly opened up a space for um, a, a talk and action and, and engagement in this broader sense. So I'll stop here and take any questions. Right. Well, thank you. Yeah.